Okay, guys. Good morning. So let us uh, start our day four session today. And uh, today is uh, day four. And it is uh, session one. And the time is six. Okay, we almost we are delayed with for 20 minutes. But that's fine. So today is September 17th, September. Uh, sir? Yes, sir. Good. Sir, yesterday, you have written, sir, uh, second session notes. No, um, I have not written. That's what. <laughs> no, no, sir. Because uh, I asked you to copy some comments, text comments. So See, you... Yeah. Uh, See, no. Yeah. No, no maybe, so, maybe those are not saved scenes. Is it so? But I don't think so, sir. Because I remember, I remember... Uh, I had stopped here itself actually. Oh, no, I mean, uh, not this, this one. one. We read some somewhere, sir. Maybe because mm -hmm. you explain variables and uh, like uh, everything, right? There you, you you wrote, sir. Variables are the table that I send value. Yeah. No, no, Exporting. no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. I mean, from here the doc, uh, the notepad is changed. Is it so? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, my God. Then what to do, sir? I think I've been... <laughs> okay, sir. No problem. Okay, sir. Refer no problem. to the video only then. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for man. I'm sorry if I missed it out. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure that I'll not do this mistake. Hmm? Okay. 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 Sure. Thank you. Okay. So... So, uh, yeah, what would be today's agenda? So, guys, today we have around, we'll be taking around three sessions, right? As you know, that we'll be taking uh, three sessions. We'll be covering a lot. And today, my emphasis is more on completing the uh, the commands plus getting into writing a basic shell scripting. Okay, it means that we will be using all the programming constructs provided by your bash shell script. Bash shell and using that programming construct, we'll start writing or we'll start writing some few scripts actually. So that would be my agenda today. Means I may I may not complete everything today because uh, it's difficult to cover up everything today. So uh, like in this three session or in this uh, six 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 hour session, uh, I'll be covering up to seventy percent of our basic uh, shell script actually. Not everything. I'll not be able to cover because when I calculated time, right, it it will not. I will not be able to complete. So what I was thinking that our discussion on this shell scripting will go even on the next weekend also, obviously, right? On 23rd, even maybe on 24th also. So what I'm planning or what I thought yesterday is that actually that we we can uh, come up, uh, join again for the session on the weekdays actually. I mean, that not every day, not even for me also it is not. It is difficult to you know like uh, take a session on every day on weekdays. So I I was just thinking that if we cover up to two sessions, that would be great actually. So we can come across after some time we can come across with the you know, we can decide on the timings actually. So uh, like what I was thinking that actually that I I'm planning to take a class on 19th that is on day after tomorrow Tuesday again on 21st. These two days you no know, I need a minimum of one and a four sessions from you. Minimum one and a half hour sessions we will be taking so that at least I will cover some more extra things so that in the weekend, no, on the 23rd, we will not feel burden. See, I don't have any problem also to take on class on 24th, but uh, like what happened, right? <laughs> we committed to take the class on two weekends. Now you're saying, sir, it's going for three weekends. Yes, we discussed a lot. It went like that, right? But still, okay, that's fine. I'm ready to sit. But the problem is that actually many people, you know, they will feel what is this? It's too much. You know, the course is going too lengthy way. So I don't want to really even, I want to, even I want to complete on time. So I would request uh, after maybe after today, right? I would request to come up with the timing. So I don't have any issue with the timing. I mean, uh, there are two timings which I can take it up actually on 19th and 21st, guys. Just you have to give me one and a half hour. So 18th and 9th, uh, 8, 19th and 21st. I'm telling you now itself because before taking class, right, it will be good that we can, you know, we can make up our mind today that when we can. So I'm, I would be okay. It will be okay if you guys are okay with even morning 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. on uh, the 19th and 20, 21st. Or else that is morning. IST timing means you have to give me from 8 a.m. to 9.30 uh, 9.30 a.m. 
one and a half hour or i can even check take up to two hours also but i will try to restrict myself for one and a half hour okay and also sir, or sir, else six I, a.m. sir six a would be good sir with this yeah i'm also okay but usually what happened now i will tell you the weekdays no uh I need to, you know, I have to, uh, no, get ready my, uh, no, uh, daughter and kids actually. So I can take it up. Uh, two days now I can adjust. That's not a for me. It's not an issue. Six o'clock also I can take. Okay. Or else, or if some people are not agreeing with us, or else night time eight thirty or eight thirty. Uh, uh, that is good, sir. Yeah, eight thirty p.m. Yeah, eight thirty to p.m. Eight or eight thirty p.m. to nine thirty or ten p.m. Whatever. Yeah, that is so, good. Sir. I'm just. I want to know from you all, okay, about this actually, so that we can at least I will take up two sessions. So I'll be covering around three hours. So we can cover up some two, some two, some good extent. So that you know, in the weekends when it comes on twenty, then no, it'll not be too much burden for all of us. What do you say? Is it fine? Yeah, morning time works actually. That's what I mean. Uh, some people are okay with morning time. Some people are. Uh, Okay with night time. That's what I want to just and uh, because I want to you know I want to make sure that everyone attends, guys. That's our main intention, so that we shouldn't miss it out actually. Seven a.m. Seven a.m. Also okay for me. I don't have an issue. Seven a.m. to that's what uh, it's all left to. I mean, uh, if I make it strict, uh, you feel feel like okay, what is this? Rajesh is making strict to come on that time only. That's what I'm making. I'm giving you a flexible time. I don't have an issue with the timing. So either morning or the late evening, because in between what happened, I'll be having my office work. I may not able to give the time at the time. So usually my core hours would be like, uh, uh, guys, my core hour would be like always. Uh, my core hour will be uh, after twelve o'clock afternoon, right? Twelve to twelve thirty nine. I log in uh, during that time. I'll be busy up to eleven o'clock or twelve o'clock night. Almost twelve thirteen hours I'll be busy. So in between I can manage to take one one and a half hour class. If I'm taking at the night time also, I can manage to take it. Right, that is not an issue for me. Okay, okay, guys. So we will we'll discuss about this. Okay, after some time, that's fine. We can discuss over what what the group. Act. Fine. Now, so what we are going to start now? So we are going to start with respect to the commands. So commands are heart of your Linux or your Unix operating system, right? Without the commands, you know, you will not be able to learn anything. Now, what are the most important commands, guys? There are a lot of commands are there, but let us start learning about the commands from the from the basic level. Like for example, like the ls command, right? Here, let me log into the servers. So I already have these two servers. Let me log in on both the servers. Let me copy the Ubuntu server. Or uh, first, let me copy the CentOS. <clears throat> copy the CentOS. IP address public IP. Go to the downloads. Again, the same stuff. Load this. Yes. Some people, yesterday they had pinged me. I think Mahesar had pinged me. Uh, the same mistake which I did on the first day, right? He was using EC2 hyphen user at the rate and give the IP address of the of the CentOS uh, machine. He was not able to log in. So please use CentOS only. So I checked actually, this is the default user which is used in the CentOS machine, right? Don't use EC2. So this is what the mistake is. And sometimes what happens, some people are not able to do that, uh, not able to, even though you're using CentOS, right, they're not able to connect it, actually. Maybe you need to change your security group settings. You need to enable the port number 22, right? So once you enable the port number 22, or just open, or just to select the all TCP port open, right, then you'll be able to connect. So this could be the major two reasons for not connecting into your CentOS server machine. Same with the Ubuntu. Ubuntu by default, you have to give the username as Ubuntu only. So I'm just selecting CentOS, open it. Okay, so same stuff for your Ubuntu. Copy the Ubuntu IP. Open the putty. Load Rajesh, this. after this, can you go over on, on three sessions? What are the all the topics you are going to cover today? Can you help me with that? No, today, sir, today I'm going to cover the commands, majorly the commands. Majorly means like like next two and a half hours something, I'll be covering the command. And the next two and a half hours or whatever, three hours, uh, like whatever, today we have six hours session, right? The first two and a half hours, I will take the commands. In the remaining four hours or two, three and a half hours, whatever you have, right? We'll be taking about the scripting, basic scripting. Basic scripting is like we will start with the if condition, if else condition, Right, and then like uh, if else if, and then like for example, you have something like a case statement. We have a looping structure. 
we have a position parameters, right? You have a, uh, you know, like uh, you have something was a uh, um, get up statements, select statements. These are some of the very, very basic programming concepts which we should know actually. So what I'll be doing in each and every, uh, I have to explain about the syntaxes. I have to write a script and show the script and exit script. So that you are familiar with what is a syntax for each and everything under I'll be writing some very from very basic script to a little bit advanced script so that you will be aware. So I'll be covering up everything today. It's not like that I only teach you basic basic in that basic also I will take one or two examples. I will show you some complicated script so that you will be able to understand it. Is it clear? So this itself will take some time sir because in each and every uh, stuff right if I'm taking if I'm writing any uh, script for if condition. I might write some three, four script. So three scripts might be basic scripts or it's just you to feel or make you understand, okay, how the if condition works. Later one script, I will write a little bit complicated, a little bit advanced script I will write today. So that you'll be able to understand. Same same with the case statement, same with the looping, everything I'll be doing like that, sir. That's it. So this one will take me to cover up to like two to three hours. It will take me to cover up all these things. So this we are just setting, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, we are setting so that you are aware of okay what things are happening in the script actually. Once you are aware of all these things, right? Then when you start looking into some other scripts, advanced scripts, right? There you will be able to appreciate how exactly things are working. Then what happened? We will come up with your own problem statement. Okay, I need to the, have this. Okay, I need to monitor the disk usage. I need to monitor the CPU. Okay, I need to uh, create an FTP server or I need to log into the FTP server. Do uh, can I automate it? Right. I need to install some softwares. I need to install the Tomcat server, deploy an application to a Tomcat server, create a, a DB. Can I do everything in the shell script? So such, such kind of a problem statement will come. So what I will do, guys, I will come up with my own problem statement and I will write a script for that because I, I mean, <laughs> guys, you don't uh, please don't expect. Uh, no, you will you will tell some program uh, problem statement and then we'll start writing script. No, no, I will first complete my uh, stuff because I have prepared in such a way that I will come up with a problem statement where maximum things are covered. You might be having your own problems at your company or you might be having your own scripts. Don't come into that say that sir, I will give this. Uh, then we can write it down, but let me complete my task, whatever I'm supposed to deliver. Is it clear, guys? Some people are there, sir, you please. Yeah, it's good only. We can discuss on that. But uh, as a flow, when I'm taking a class, no, let me complete my portion, what I want to do it, actually. Then we can come up with your problem statement. Then you tell your script. Then I'll write a script and show you how exactly we can achieve your task, actually. Clear? So like that, there are many are there. So we'll be discussing about the functions. We need to discuss about the set and awk programming, scripting, right? Like that, where there are many things are there. Some of the things which I missed it out, maybe like cron job, ad job, those things I'll be covering. Some other things are, are, are there which I have already told that I'll be covering. So many things are there we'll be covering up. So that's the reason what happened. Why I'm asking you to come on the two week uh, weekdays means on 19th and 24th because I can cover up some more things. Maybe today I may not cover this set and off scripting. I may not cover. I will be covering in these two days. So that we have some big, big uh, chunk of work, uh, big chunk of understanding which you have to do, which I can cover on this. I need not to, again, wait for the next weekend to come. In the next weekend, we will try to concentrate on some other things. And after that, we even we have to see some of the troubleshooting, SSS troubleshooting, network troubleshooting, some few things which I will be covering. Plus, we will also discuss about the inter question answers. So there itself, I need some ample time from you. So it might go up to two, two and a half hour sessions on or discussing all inter important inter question answers. Is it clear, guys? So we have a lot of things which will be coming across now, which will be coming now. So we have to concentrate on each and everything now, whatever, because this is what we, you know, we want to learn now, all the scripting part now. Is it clear? Okay, fine. So now, so, yeah. So if some of you, some of you already know all these things, it is good. That, but you will be learning some extra thing also. It's not like that only on basic thing I'm covering. Some other extra interesting thing which I'll be covering, which you might not be aware, so it'll be interesting for you also. Some of you who already know this. So now, now, so I've logged into the system, guys. Now, so let us try to understand some commands. We'll try to understand some commands. Let us start with the ls command. You know that we have already been executing these commands from the day one onward, but still, okay. So ls command, 
you will list out all the files and directories which are there in the present working directory. That's what it says actually, ls command says. And it is very much useful guys because you need to always check what are the files and directories which are there in your present working directory. You have to execute the ls command, correct? Now, after the, uh, so what exactly Linux does actually, or the Unix does, whenever you are having commands guys, always it is not that only you need to only execute the commands or only you have to remember the commands, no. Because every command in Linux or in Unix has an options actually. Mm -hmm. It has an options. So you need to even learn the options also. Very much mandatory. Why they have provided the option? See, basically what happened, whenever you are executing the command, you will get an output, fine. But sometime what happened, right? You need a, some kind of a desired output. A user might need some kind of a desired output. Now, for example, you'll say, sir, you are executing the ls command. It is displaying all the files and arteries. That is good, sir. Now, I want apart from the file, apart from the names of the file or directory, I want to display some other information also, some more information. Is there any way, sir, to display it? Yes. <clears throat> what you have to do? You have to do an ls command. You have to give the space, and always you need to use some options. So. You have to, whenever you're using any options in Linux, actually, you have to always start with a hyphen or minus visit and provide the option value. So I'll use as a L. So when I do an LS hyphen L, it does a long listing visit. What it does? It does a long listing, right? Long listing is something like apart from the name of the file. So here also it is displaying the name of the file or directory, Amar, Bob, first script kishore but apart from this apart from this guys there are many other options are also there are many other information also there which are been displayed so this is what uh you know in linux sir uh, it makes or in unix it makes very much flexible that the way user needs his uh, the way user needs the output right uh, uh he can use uh, certain options accordingly along with the command so always guys whenever you are learning any kind of a commands, please make sure that you also study all the options provided by that for that command. Always. That is the best habit always. So whenever you come across with any command, you have to even see that, okay, is there any option is given for that? Okay, let me dig into that option or let me see how. Because when you start understanding the commands and its options, you will be understanding the behavior of that command very well. And you will get an idea of how I can use that command uh, for automating any tasks. Tomorrow you want to do some automation tasks, you will tend to use that command. And you need to, you will be tend to use the option along with that. Actually. So that's a reason. Please always make a habit of going through the commands, going through even the option also. Now, ls command will list out all the files and directories which are in the present working directory, right? Now, if you want to understand what exact ls does actually ls will display but i want i want to have only one line information about that command you can just say what is ls see it will tell you that it lists the directory content just one line information okay just one line information <clears throat> now whenever guys whenever you are coming across any commands it is always mandatory or it is always important that you need to understand every command and the option with the help of a manual page. Every command in Linux has a manual page. So manual page means you have you, where you will get all kind of information about that command and the options. So how to get into the man page? Many of you already know that I have to use a man command. Man means manual, page, ls, and say enter. You see it, it will display you that it will display that what that command does. It lists out all the directory structures or directory content, sorry. Now, always, guys, whenever you're opening any man page, the very important thing that you need to understand what that name of that, what exactly the command does. What is a synopsis? Synopsis means how to make use of that command in your command line. So here what happened, that he says that I need to use ls command. Along with that, I have an option. Along with that, even you can pass even the file name also. This is very important. It means that here he is telling that how you can make use of this command in your command line. Clear? Now, after that, he will describe the command. He will elaborate, describe what that command does. Okay. And then like you have a mandatory argument or the options. Here you have two. One is a short format and other is a long format. You can use ls hyphen a or you can use ls space hyphen f and all. So whoever has designed this command, okay, 
what happened that they have kept or they have given both the options short term long long term or long format also okay but usually in the industry people doesn't use a long format suppose i want to use hyphen b ls hyphen b ls space hyphen b why i will use a ls space hyphen f and escape not recorded why i need to necessarily type it or i need to remember it so usually people don't use the long format they don't use it but sometime what happened right if you go through some script or very old script somebody would have written some 25 years back they have written the script they would have used this long format also okay but both output you'll get the same only it is not like that you'll get a different output if you do a ls space hyphen a if you get it you'll get all the files which are even hidden or which are hidden also if you say ls hyphen space hyphen f and all it will also get the same output so don't worry about the output so now what happened that always you please consider only the short form like hyphen c hyphen b hyphen a hyphen d write that only don't go with any long understanding the long option i mean you don't even remember also it is very difficult is it is, is it good that if i use ls hyphen h or is it good that if i use ls space hyphen f and human hyphen readable not required right why you have to remember so but still manual page has both the options they will give both the options for you now very important that always whenever you are going through the man page open the man page like this guys open the man page go to the man page like this scroll down using the down arrow mark key okay you will come up across tons and tons of options you could see that they would have given some other extra information also which you might have to go across sometime you have to go across because manual page will give enormous information about that command sometime what happened right at the end they might even provided uh, the information that there was a bug for that command and this bug was fixed like this or else sometime what happened no that command might have some corner cases where uh, you will not be able to get an output if you use this option like that they would have given it so uh, usually what happened that people tend to read this man page completely so that they will be aware of how exactly the command works if there is any bug if there is any corner cases where the command will not properly work uh, that also they will mention in the command i'm not sure whether how many of you have uh, really gone through that level because uh, when i was working right when i mean early right i was going through the whole man page completely and i was understanding i was executing the commands along with the option also i made a habit of always going through the commands and the option so there are many options are there guys which you have to go through it actually right but again what happened right you might ask the question sir if you have a command and you could see that i have an option a b c d e f t h i j k r s t v w v oh my god it's almost all 26 alphabetical characters are there sir it means that all, almost all 26 options are there do you think that i have to learn all the options along the ls command it will it will take a lot of time so i would say that no you need not to go it completely so at least minimum four to five very important options you have to go is it clear guys for every command guys the options they will be tons and tons of options will be there tons in sense like i'm saying that there will be many options so i need not to go through all the options again what happened most frequent used now viber might come to know that sir how which are the frequent users sir when you start working in a system when you start working in industry you will come across with the most used frequent options also you need not to worry so because you will be seeing a lot of people are executing some options along with the command or else at your workplace you will be tend to use some options so based on your requirement right, you will learn then and there itself so it is not a big thing that you can't learn you can learn then and there itself everything as soon as you come with the commands you will see that okay this option this option right you will yourself you will realize that okay these are the important options man definitely i'll be using these options uh, you know in it, at my workplace so like that what happened right it based on your experience based on the way you work uh, in a company right you will you will tend to learn some options so the most important options you have to read it five to six option not more than that okay as and when suppose tomorrow some options uh, something requirement comes where you have to really use a particular option which you have never used at all yeah then go to the man page try to see what that option is and then you make use of in your command but you know very well that many people uh, almost all of us what we will do what we have an habit that whenever we come across with any kind of a challenge or requirement by the company or by the project right you will first tend to go to the google only so google as we know it's a best friend it will you will find a lot of articles where you will go through it oh you might see some options oh you might think okay i have never used this option man at all 
Yeah, definitely it's not required for you. You have never used it. Now that requirement came so that you need to even understand that particular option. So you will be learning then and there itself, guys. Don't worry about that. But whenever you are going through any kind of mind, please make sure that minimum four to five options, you should know it. And those are very mandatory. And also what happened, right? That would be helpful even for an interview purpose also. Because if you go for interview, it's under, not only with the commands, they'll even ask the option also. They'll ask you, okay, man, is there, what is an option with the LS command where you can, you know, where you can display the inode number of a file or a directory. So you have to say, you have to say LS hyphen I like that. Clear guys. So options also, you need to read it. That's the reason I'm saying that always open the man page, uh, casually scroll to into the complete man page. Try to see just what that option does. So hyphen M I've never used. Fill uh, no width with a comma separated line list of enters. Okay, I don't know. Maybe we might be using okay. LS hyphen L. Oh, just now Rajesh exhorted it's a long listing format. Okay, whenever you want to display the files in a kilobyte, I have to use a hyphen key option. So default it will display all the files with 1024 block size. Yeah, I mean, I might use it actually. Yeah, it's not like that every time I use it. I might use it at some uh, requirement. I might <coughs> use this option hyphen I, I know it like that. So what are the most important? One more thing, when you, after you open the mm -hmm. man page, guys, after you open the man page, if you go through it, now whenever you want to come out from the man page, you have to always press Q. Q means quit, quit from the man page. If you open the man page, you have seen, observed that okay, there's a Q option, is a Q means quit to the man page. You have to always press Q. Q will come out. Now, sometime what happened at some people might need more information than the manual page. Yeah, manual page is giving it, but I need a more information. I will go with the info command, info space LS. See, this will give much more information than the manual page actually. See, even though the options are same, but at the, at the beginning you saw that there were a lot of theoretical things were there about the LS side, you will come across it like this. So some people will even go with the info page also. Clear? Info page will give you more information than the man page. So here, how you'll put it, you have to say shift to colon Q and enter. Shift to colon Q. Shift to colon Q. Enter. Or just Q, I'll say. Yeah. Also, it will come. So when you open the info LS, press Q, you'll come out from the info page. Is it fine, guys? So why I'm telling you at the beginning that because when I'm going with the commands, most of the commands, I will directly use some options. So you might ask me, sir, where is this option is coming? Sir, I have gone to the man page, man, I'll say. Then through that man page, I have understood it. Now, here what happened, guys, there are various sections are there in the man page. Now, if you watch carefully, if you do a man of LS, you see it, it is opening a LS command, and you could see that it is opening under the manual page section one. So manual page section one is always for the executable commands. So like that, there are some eight to nine manual page sections are there, right? If you quit it, if you say a man of man, see, a man of man means you are understanding the manual page of man itself. Now, if you come down, can you see the table, guys? Can you see it? The table below shows the section number of the manual page. Yeah. Yeah, Uday, please mute. So if you open this man of man, can you see that there are nine manual page sections are there, guys? But as a system admin or as a DevOps engineer, we will not go through all these different sections. We are only maximum will always be going with this only. But still, just for your knowledge or information, I'm saying that first manual page section will always be for your executable program or your shell commands. Second is for the system calls. Okay, Rajesh said something about system call. Okay. Third about the library call. API call. Fourth is for the special files, actually. Fifth is for file format. Sixth is for game. We don't use it, really use it. Six, seventh is for manual page section for some miscellaneous things. Okay. Eighth is for your system administrator. Only the root user who runs the command, right? Like, for example, pass wd command, right? User add command, right? Ping command. You want to get to those man pages, you have to go to the, you have to visit to the manual page section eight. And the ninth is your kernel routine, actually. It's a non standard you have a lot of commands which are related to the kernel space, actually. Like, for example, you have print K. I don't think so that you will get a man page of print K. Man 9 of print K. Print K, see, there is no manual page. In it. But you have to install the package so that you will even get the man of print K. You can go to the Google, guys. I'm just telling you. 
go to the Google and just say man nine print k. This is for your kernel function, but you will say that sir, see ninth page section of your manual page. <coughs> see here they have given about this print k. What the print the kernel message? This is internally used within your kernel space, so we need not to worry about this one. I'm just telling you the ninth manual page section is for your kernel routine or your kernel functions. So, but we will always deal maximum. We will always deal with your with your first manual page section only. So most of the commands, whatever you're doing, right, it will be always with the first manual page section. Is it clear? But sometimes what happened, right, in C program, you know that there's a printf function is there. You know, printf, scanf, and all, right, you would have seen in C language, right? There, if you want to go through it, printf, right, you have to go to the print2, man2, and specify that, or man3, specify that printf. For example, you could see that man of third manual page section, I want to go to the printf. Okay, so the second one. Oh man, why is this not this? If I do a man of printf, it will take you to the first manual page because printf is also there's a command with the name printf. Right? But here what happened? I think guys, I have to install the package so that I will get it. Otherwise, it used to display it. When I do a man of three of printf, right? It used to display the manual page of the printf function. Similarly, so man of three of uh, malloc. It's not there actually. I need to install the package to do it. Okay. So uh so uh so that's the reason you have to always go with the manual page section one itself that is a default so here you need not to really worry much okay now along with the commands what i'll be doing that i will be explaining about three to four options on each and every command so that you will be aware of it like for example you have an ls hyphen l long listing <coughs> okay then ls hyphen a it will display even the Hidden files also. So you'll be having a lot of hidden files or a hidden directory. You could see that any files or a directory, if it starts with a dot, it's a hidden file. So in yesterday's class also, I think I explained to you that I created a, a rubbish directory, rubbish file. Actually, I gave start with the dot. It's a hidden file. So always it is better that whenever you want to, don't want to display along the ls command, those files, right? You can switch it to hidden directory. Like, so for example, you have a bob file. You want to make it as even hidden file you can just move bob to dot bob like that you can move it actually now when you do an ls bob file is not just visible but you want to display everything is ls hyphen a mm -hmm. see now you can see that you have a dot bob file correct guys so that's how and then like ls hyphen i it is for inode number so every file or directory will have an inode number ls with the hyphen capital f so it will show you what type of file it is. So we already discussed at the very beginning that whenever you have a directory, it should always end with a slash. Whenever you have a pipe file, it should always you know, display with this symbol, pipe symbol. Whenever there's an executable file, it always ends with a star. So this, <coughs> with this special symbol also, you will be able to understand what type of file it is. Okay. One more thing very important that for example, like whenever you have created a lot of files, whenever you have created a lot of files, you want to display the files uh, based on a timestamp when it got created, latest to file which when it was created. So you want to display this, you will always say ls hyphen lt. See, it will display whichever the files which got latest created. Now, yesterday you could see that at the end, uh, I created this file, right? It's like, so I've written a shell script actually. This was the latest file which I created in this directory, in this present directory. So it will show me. Some people, what they'll say that, they'll say that they want to do a reverse action. So you could see that some people are using ls ltr. So, but I want to display, but in a reverse order, you say, see? So where the oldest file will become at the top and the newest file will become at the bottom. So this is the very most important option, guys, which we will be using most of the time in the industry. Correct? Some of you might be using this, right? ls ltr a lot of time, right? Correct, guys. Do you agree with me? So ARM is reverse, actually. You are in, you are reversing the output, actually. So some people, you can use like this, ls hyphen l hyphen t hyphen r. This doesn't look sense, actually. Even though you can run this command like this, but it doesn't make sense. You have to use, always you have to use one hyphen and then use multiple options like this. Clear? Okay. So this is all about ls and ls command, guys. 
Yes. What about LSF and AL10? That's what I'm saying. AIM is all hidden. All hidden file. LSF and ALT RT. Yes. You will even show all the even the hidden also it will show. AIM is all. Like that you have to understand. Correct, Priyanka? Okay. Now, <clears throat> so you I, I remember I think you remember guys, I had even exude the DR command also. DR also will display all the files in the directory, but there is no coloring effect. So I have to use DR hyphen F and C O L O R color. So now this will display in a coloring. So this DR command is there, uh, is there in your Windows operating system. So the same command is also used even in Linux also. Clear? Okay. So LS is very important, which we will be using it, right? What else? Next is a date command. So it will show you the current time and date based on the based. <laughs> Based on your, uh, you know, like based on your, uh, uh, based on your server under which location it is stored, right? So it is there, right? Based on that, that particular zone time it will show you. Because this server I I took from the AWS uh, Northern Virginia region, right? It is showing me the Northern Virginia region's timestamp now. Okay, even you can even change it also, but I am not really changing the time actually. So there is a command date hyphen s option, and you can provide the an option, and you can uh, you can change the time also but i'm not doing it actually date with the hyphen s option okay now very important is that one more option that if you use date with hyphen capital sorry date with hyphen capital a option it will show you the timing in the year month and the date like this with a hyphen off with a hyphen so this is also one of the options which we'll be using so now, how this date command is updated or how this date command is coming from? So, you know, guys, in your uh, in your uh, hardware, you have a chip, you know, the CMOS chip. CMOS chip is a CMOS chip is run by a lump, some lithium battery. Okay, that CMOS chip will be keep ticking, actually. It will be keep ticking. So, it will be keep updating the timestamp, even though you are, you know, like your machine is off. You know, like you have, you have, uh, you have, I have a switch off my laptop. Right. But still, when I reboot my system or I boot my system again back, right, you could see that it will show me the correct time and date only. Now you'll ask how that it is happening, sir. Even your system is off, how it will understand or how it's going to update the time. Because, right, in my laptop, right, inside my laptop, there's a CMOS battery, there's a CMOS chip is there in a motherboard, which is attached with some lithium, uh, lithium battery. So that lithium battery will give a power to that chip, actually. That chip will keep ticking, actually. It means that it will keep updating the time. Now, the date command, when you are executing the date command, now it is actually reading from the chip itself, actually. But to be very specific to the very uh, sense, it is not actually reading from that uh, chip, actually. It is reading from one of the kernel register, known as a HW clock. So if you run pseudo HW clock and enter, you could see that it is showing me the current time and date, even with the fraction second also. So... This is now the command which you are actually reading from your kernel registry. Kernel in the kernel, there's a registry. From the kernel registry, you're reading the time, and this registry is the one which will be keep updated by your CMOS chip actually. Clear? So now date command when you are running, you are actually whatever the date which is there in your hardware clock register, right? That is it is the date command is reading from this hardware clock chip or hardware clock register. And this hardware clock register is updated by your then hardware knows the CMOS hardware. Or CMOS chip actually. Is it clear? <clears throat> so now, so that's how it is. You can even uh, display the file of time, date and time, even with the HW clock, but you should be a pseudo user or should you should be a root user. Normal user, he cannot run this command HW clock. Like Rajesh, he cannot run like this. Okay, HW clock. See, Rajesh is not a pseudo user. He cannot run this command. He cannot run this command. Only the root user or the super, no, sorry, or your so let me remove this because yesterday I showed you, right? Okay. Okay. Now, along with the date command, you have many other options, guys. For example, if you want to display the year, I can just say percentage plus uh, plus percentage y. So you have to give the space plus 
percentage y it will show the it will show the last two digit of the year if you give the capital y it will show the complete year similarly the month small m okay capital m similarly you have a day today is 17th like that so you have a multiple <laughs> multiple option okay so along with that and uh, uh, you know like it is very important that you also know these options because like in most of the script when you are writing right we will be using all these options so i'll be showing you some of the script where you will be using all these options actually so if you go for the man of date command man of date you will see if you come down you will see like that so many options are there if you come down can you see here formats which controls output like percentage a percentage b percentage c so we will be using all this most of these options in our day to day activity while writing a script so hence it is always important that some of the formats also you remember this clear after this very important that there is something like a tal tal will show you the current month calendar okay sometimes people might need it or else if you use a cal of minus 3 it will show me the three months the previous month the current running month and the next month actually calendar okay now after that what is the next command so there are some commands are there guys which we always used in a very day to day activity like for example you are having a command like where you want to create some files actually so i'll be using a touch command i'll be using a, a echo command even i can even use the cat command to create a file even some kind of something like greatest and i use it to create a file even with help of a less command more command okay i can create a file even with help of a vi command i can create a file even with help of a nano command so vi and nano are the editors we use in linux so any one options will be used or any one command will be used to create a file actually but generally you see in the people people will always tend to use a touch command to create a file or else they max use a vi command correct so i want to create a file actually i want to create some files actually right i already created some files but let me do touch command if i do a touch command and if i take some names actually suppose i'll take a name as uday or else i can take a name of uh, um, uh kaushal yeah or girish or whatever so i'll take the name as girish actually touch girish see i'm creating a file so you are creating an empty file or a zero byte file so this girish is an empty file now again when you run a touch on the girish it will not recreate the file again but one important thing in interview they might ask sometime i don't know for uh, I mean, earlier long backs uh, they used to ask actually what is the difference between a touch command and the vi command you create a file they'll ask you so it says a touch and vi both does a both things sir both it does sir actually both it does the same thing it will create a file what is the difference it does there's no difference you'll say no there's a small unique difference is there when you have a file okay already you have a file like <coughs> girish file already i created it already long back i created it suppose i run a touch on the same girish it will not recreate the file it will it will just but what touch will do touch will update the time stamp see here earlier for the girish can you see that it was september 17 133 now you could see that it is 134 it has just updated the time stamp that's all this is what the small difference you have to tell <clears throat> vi command when you open a file vi grish you will open the file you are not doing anything you just quit the file it will not really update the time stamp but whereas when you whenever you do the touch on the same file always touch command will always update the time stamp this is what one important things which you have to tell clear guys okay now <clears throat> so you can create the touch i can even use a echo command to create a file you have to just say echo greater than sign and specify some file name so i will use a file name i will use a file by name uh, kaushal i will take the name as kaushal a u s h a l see so you are creating a file by with the help of echo command or else i can create use a greater sign what are the other names i have a, uh, a yeah chandra i'll say chandra see i'm using a greater sign 
So you can use any of this option, guys, to create it. But most available people use in the industry is a touch or the VI command to create a file, actually. So VI is a VI is an editor, actually, we say. Vim editor, we say. Clear? So that's all. And now, <clears throat> okay. So now, the most important thing, again, uh, which I, uh, okay, which uh, I miss it out is when you do an LS-L, a long listing, guys, you would see that there are many outputs are coming along with the file name or data name. If you see it, watch it carefully, there are around 10 dashes are there actually like this. 10 dashes are there. And you could see that it is providing you the permissions actually. It is providing you with all the permissions. Correct. Now, what is this all about? Okay, we will say that Rajesh, when you do LSFNA, it is showing me some columns. How many columns are there? First column, okay. Second column, this one, two, one, two, one, 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 five, one, two. This is the second column. Third column, this is one. Fourth column is one. Fifth column is one. Sixth column, seventh column, eighth column, ninth column. So you will say that when I do an LSI funnel, you are getting actually nine columns. In interview, they might ask you, what is the second column of your LSI funnel output, man? I mean, nowadays they don't ask it. I'm just telling you. They might ask. Somebody might ask. You to say, sir, second column will provide you the hard links. Hard links, anyhow, we discuss what is hard link. Okay, so second column will always provide you the hard links, number of hard links, which are there for the file or a directory. Yes. <clears throat> Whenever you create any directory, this Amr is a directory. This is an empty directory. If you go inside the Amr directory, nothing is there, sir. It's empty. But if you do an LSF and L, you could see that it is always showing you the it is always showing you the two. Whenever you create any directory, by default, there will be two hard links are there. Why there are two hard links? When you do a, when you get inside an Amr, when you do LS, LS, nothing is there, but when you do LSF and A, you could see that there are two dots are there. One is a single dot and other is a double dot. This you can understand it as a links actually. That's the reason it is showing as a two. It is showing as a is it clear? Whenever you create a directory, guys, there will be a two, by default, there will be two links. How to prove it? Go inside directory, do a layer of an A, it will show you the dot and the double dot. With that, you can tell that, okay, it has a two links, hard link. One link, a single dot is for itself, double dot is for its two, its parent directory. So why parent directory means, suppose you are inside the AML directory, <clears throat> you want to come out or you want to go back to the previous directory, you have to always use a CD dot dot. Some people might ask you know hey, why you are using cd dot dot man hey, you will say that hey, cd dot dot will actually take me to the back actually correct that is fine but how do you exactly you say sir cd dot means the, the double dot is a link to link to what it is a link to your parent directory here what happened amar the parent directory the the, the parent directory for amar is centos for the centos for the centos the centos the parent directory is home for the home, the parent directory slash. For the slash, no, there is no parent directory. Parent, uh, the file system starts with the slash only. So slash is the ultimate parent directory. So you could see that there is a directory within a directory within a directory, right? So each and every directory will have a parent directory to its own. So how it understand to which parent directory have to go that this double dot will tell you that you have, it, this double dot will be pointing to its parent directory. Because here, Amar, the double dot is actually pointing to the CentOS directory. For the CentOS directory, so since I'm in a CentOS directory, see, I'm in a CentOS directory. When you do LS A, can you see here also you have a double dot, 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 and dot? Yeah, double dot means what? A double dot means it is actually you it's for the home directory. Means it this CentOS will be pointing to a home directory. So if I do a CD dot dot and say enter, see, I'm going to the home directory. Again, you do LS A here. See, you have double dot and double dot. Again, you do a CD double dot, double uh, dot dot, enter. It will take you to the parent directory. Here to have, uh, here also, Raj, do have, a, yeah, here also you have. But here, if you do a CD dot dot, it doesn't go anywhere because your file system will start with the slash itself. Slash is the ultimate parent directory. Clear? What is a dot means? Dot is for itself. Like, for example, if I want to go to the AMA directory, CD AMA directory, if I do an LSF and A, you have a double dot and single dot. If I do a CD space dot and enter, you will not go anywhere. You will see there itself. Means it is for itself. So you need to have a link for itself. 
as well as you need to have a hard link to its parent directory. That's what that's what you do a cd to dot dot. Means dot dot means it will take you to the parent directory. It will take you back to one one back to the one directory where uh, from where I mean I mean where it will be pointed into a parent directory. Is it clear, guys? Does it make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so always have to understand in that way. Clear? Okay. Now, now when you do an ls hyphen l, second column will give you the number of hard links. Okay, fine. <coughs> and the first and the third column is user ID. Fourth column is group ID. Fifth column is a file size in bytes. Sixth column, seventh column, eighth column. These three columns are based for your timestamp when the file was got created. And the last column is nothing but a file or directory name. That's what you have to understand with the ls l output option. But if you see here in the ls l output option, you could see that the first column is giving you permissions actually. It will provide the permissions actually. Now, usually what happened, right, guys, there are 10 dashes are there like this. 10 dashes are there. One, two, three, four, like this. If you really calculate it, right, if you do an ls and l there are 10 dashes are there, like that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, like this. Always. The first dash, this, uh, this first dash, right? This first dash will tell you the file type. File, it will tell you the file type. If it is a D, it means that it is a directory. If it is a blank, it, if it is empty or a blank, it is a normal file. If it is L, it is a soft link like this. Like here, we don't have a soft link, but let me create a soft link. For example, let me create a Alice file. Touch Alice. So I have an Alice file. Now when I do LS and S, Alice, and I give a Bob. See, when you do LS and L, you see that Al Bob is actually pointed to Alice. So Bob is a soft link file but if you see the first dash it is l or oh, l represents it is a soft link file or a symbolic link we say similarly you have a file something like where if you see a symbol something like s it is a socket file wherever you see a b uh, it's a block file it's a block device file block file so can you see here in the my fifo it's a pip4 file or it's a pipe file you could see there's a symbol the p so always the first dash will represent what type of file it is. So that is reserved for the file type, the first dash. Rest all other nine dashes, guys, these nine dashes are given for your permissions. So this nine dashes, the next rest nine dashes are for permissions. Usually, always if you take any permissions, broadly they are categorized into uh, five uh, important permissions actually what are those permissions so you have a read permission we call it r read permission okay okay which will give the value as a four actually write permission we call in short as a uh, in short w or we call the write permission internet is represented by a number not a two and execute permission is not but exe to execute which has a permission known as a one this is some numerical value which will be given for this three permission, read, write, execute. <clears throat> okay, apart from this, you have some special permission like set ID, uh, set user ID, user ID and set group ID. Okay, special permission. And one more is there something with the sticky bit permissions. So if you see it, the permissions are actually categorized into this five Types actually set user ID, set group ID, sticky bits and all. Now, so this we will be discussing set as uh, user ID, group ID, and sticky bits later after time, time, some point of time, not now. Okay. So now, if you take any files or a directory, guys, always what happened, right? You will be, yeah, ACL is there. Yes, we will discuss that ACL also. ACL is a some special category of, uh, you know, like uh, some special permission that I'm not considering in this list actually, but it has some special permissions. Like for example, you have a set FACTL command is there. Get FACTL command is there. So we'll be we will see if you have a time, we will discuss this also. Okay. So now, so here what happened, guys? Those nine dashes are provided by your 
uh, are provided for the are provide are the permission which is provided actually. But this three nine this nine dashes right they are divided into three categories we say. So what are those three categories? The first three dash is for your owner or the user of the file. Who is owner? What kind of owner are you called the user? The next three dash, the other three dash is for the group actually. And the last three dash is for others. This is how this rest nine dash. The first dash is for the file type. Okay, that we will leave it. The remaining nine dashes, how it is divided? First three dash is for the owner. The second three dash is for the group. And the third three dash is for others category. So these are different types of users or the different categories of users we have. Owner is something like who has created a file. Now here, I have created a file. If you go to the CentOS machine, you could see that uh, you, know, Chan, uh, you know, there's a file by name Grish has been created, Kaushal has been created, Kishore has been created. Who created this file? CentOS user has created a file. So CentOS is the owner of that file. CentOS owner is the owner of the file. Suppose I switch to the Rajesh. Here what happened, I'll start creating a file. Touch uh, file one, file two. See, I'm creating a file, touch file. So file one and <coughs> file two. Who is the owner of the file? Rajesh is the owner of the file. So like that, whenever any, the before user who has logged in, whenever he creates a file, he will be the owner, primary owner of that file, or we call it the user of the file, right? And one more thing I just left actually, A is something like for all actually, okay? So now, so whenever a user or the owner creates a file, usually what happened, right? He will have a permission like read permission, write permission and execute permission. Because he's the owner, no, he need to have all the permission to his file, right? So by default, he will get these permissions. Yes, okay. Group is something like where what happened, right? Suppose I am the owner of the file. Uh, in my For my file, my wife will be a group. She comes under the group category. So what I will do, I will give her the read permission. I'll give her the execute permission, but I will not give any write permission at all to her. Because why I need to give a write permission? She might tamper my file, right? She might do anything, right? So it is better not to give the read, write permission. So I will not give a write permission. She'll only have a read and execute permission. So she can go to the file. She can execute that file if she need it actually, right? Others category, somewhere your, uh, your uh, you know, like uh, your uh, far cousin comes actually. Your far cousin comes. He will be under the group category, right? He'll be under the group category, right? Sorry, he'll be under the others category, right? Why I need to give a read per why I need to give a read permission? Why I, why I need to give a write permission? I'll only give execute permission for him now. Like this way, what happened, right? For every file or a directory, guys, you will be giving some set of permissions. Okay. So these permissions are given to owner, group, and others, like this. Okay. And how these permissions are given, by default, permissions are given. There is something known as the UMask actually. Based on the UMask value. The permissions are set actually. Permissions are provided or permissions are given are provided for both file as well as a directory. So based on the UMask value, the permissions are provided. Now, if you see it here, right? See now, CentOS, see this uh, <coughs> CentOS has created many files like you have Alice, Bob, Bob, Ravi and all so many, right? They're having their own permissions. Right. When you do an LSI for L, okay, you could see for the others, you have a others read permission you're having. Similarly for Chandra, for others you're having read permission. So here what happened? You're only giving a read permission for others. You are not given a write permission and execute permission. Correct? Default US mass zero zero. Yeah, yes, we will come across with that now, actually. Now, so now what happened? U mask is, is the value through which actually a default permission is given either for a file or a directory case. Now, if I'm creating a directory, if I do an MKDR, okay, what is the, I, if I want to take any name, what are the other names I have here? Uh, you have something named you know, the, uh, Rish also can take Rakesh is there actually. So let me use the word name Rakesh, R-A-K-S. I'm using, using MKDR command to create a directory, Rakesh. Now you can see that actually that when I do LSF and L, 
Rakesh is given some set of permissions. Now the question comes out, you might ask, sir, how this default permission is given? This default permission is given, guys, based on the UMask value. Now, what is a UMask value? If you execute a command UMask and enter, can you see it is showing you an octal value, 0, 0, 2, triple 0, 2. So this is the UMask value for your normal user. So this is an octal value. So this is octal value. And for your uh, UMask value for the root user, what is the UMask value for the root user? It will be 0, 0, 2, 2. That will be the UMask value for root user. Always root user has a UMask value of 0022. Clear? So when I switch to the root user, when I execute the UMask value, can you see? This is the UMask value, 0022. So based on the UMask value, some set of permissions are provided. Like for example, whenever you are creating a directory, here recently, just now, I created a directory by name Rakesh. So Rakesh is having owner is a Rakesh owner of the file. Uh, sorry, not Rakesh. Centos owner of the Rakesh directory. So for the Rakesh, Centos will have a read, write, execute all these three permissions for a user. All these three permission read, write, execute for the group. Okay, we'll have. And for the others, you have a read and execute permission, no write permission for the others category. Now this is some kind of a default permission is given. This is based on your UMask value. If I execute UMask value, you will get this value. Or else you can even use a UMask with a hyphen capital S option. You will get this. This is the permission which is given for it. So you could see that for user always read, write, execute will be given. For the group, read, write, execute will be given. For the others, only read and execute will be given. O means others, G means group, U means user, or the owner we say. So this also I should have mentioned it. So U means user, G means shortcut guys, group, O means other section. Okay, so now, so now when it comes to here, where you are logged in as a normal user, so when I execute the UMask command, UMask command, you will show the 002. Now, whenever you're creating a directory, Whenever you're creating a directory, you're creating a directory. For the directory, always it should be 777 minus. Always, whenever you are minusing, you should minus with the UMask value. Forget about the first octal value, zero. It is for special permission. You have to consider the, the, the other three values, actually. That is 002. So to say 0, 0, and 2. If you minus it, guys, what you're going to get? You will get the value 5. Seven, seven, right? Right, this is the value you get. So what do you mean by seven means? Seven is the value, octa value, which will be a combination of four plus two plus one, seven. So you have a read, write, exit for the owner, first one. You have a read and exit for the group. You have a read and exit for the other. So four plus one is five, five, like this. So read and exit for the owner, Read and execute for the group, read and execute for the others. See, that's the reason what happened, right? If you say read and read execute for the owner, read and read uh, owner, read and read execute for the group, and read and execute for the others. So you could see that whenever a director is getting created, always the value 777 will be minus two with the UMask value 002. Similarly, whenever any files are getting created, I use a touch command to create a file. So whenever you're getting creating a file, whenever creating a file, Always the value will be 666 actually. The value will be 66. So always the 6666 value should be minus with the UMAS value that is 002. Right? Then you will get the value as what will get the values, guys? We'll get the value as 664. So 6 means combination of 4 plus 2, read and write for the owner. Then read and write for the group. And 2 is the, 4 is the, but read for the others. See, can you see here? Come here. Can you see for the normal user like Alice? Read, read and write for the owner. Read and write for the group. Read for the others. 
But you might ask, sir, Alice file is there. He doesn't have an exit permission for the owner because, but owner or the user should have, right? Yes, he should have, but that is not given. But you can forcibly even exit also because you are the owner, right? You have a right to even to run that program forcibly. Even though the permission is not there, you can still run the program because you are the owner of the file. Right? That's all. Now you will say, sir, why the why the exit permission is given for the directory? Why you are, it is given? Yes, guys, you should always give a write permission. You should always give an exit permission. Write permission, why you're giving that? Because whenever you want to write or whenever you want to create any kind of a files or some other subfolders within that, actually, you need to have a write permission. Exit permission means whenever you want to get inside this directory, you need to have an exit permission. Without an exit permission, suppose your directory, if you're not getting X permission, that exit permission, no, you cannot get inside the directory at all. Always write, whenever you are creating a directory, write permission should be given so that you can write something inside that inside the directory. It means that by, for, by creating any files or other some other subdirectories. And also you need to have an exit permission to get inside. So whenever you are doing a CD to Pratap, so when you are doing CD to the Pratap, you need to have an exit permission. Without exit permission, you cannot get inside the directory at all. So here, for example, I'm just saying you, for example, I can change the permission how I can change the permission, guys, by using a chmod command. So if I use a chmod command, okay, I will use a 664 onto the Pratap directory. So now you could see that ls and l. Can you see that the Pratap is having read, write, read, write, and read permission? Now, can I get inside the Pratap? See, permission denied because you don't have an exit permissions. So now I will do a chmod 7, 7, or whatever, or 7, or 7. Four and just tell a Pratap directory. Now you change the Pratap directory permission. Now if you do an LSFNL, can you see here Pratap is having now having exit permission. Now can I do a CD to Pratap? Yes, now you can do CD to the Pratap. Now assume that actually you will even remove the exit permission also. So how to do it? CH mod. Okay, you will just say 4 plus 1, that, but read and write 4 plus 1 is 5, right? So I will give the five permissions. I'll give a four, four permission to Pratap. Now you could see that Pratap is having read permission and exit permission, but he don't have a write permission. Correct? So I can do a CD to the Pratap, but can I create any file here? Touch file one. You don't have a permission because you don't have a write, write permission, you have removed it. You, whenever you have a write permission, they don't, you can write inside a directory. Otherwise, you can't write it. Is it clear, guys? Till here. So chmod is a very important command, guys, which we'll uh, use for changing the file permissions. Okay. Any doubts so far? No, sir. So some of you already know all these things, but it's just kind of a repetitive because uh, many of you doesn't have the knowledge on this command. So that's what I'm uh, doing. Okay. Now, so that's how based on the U mask value, the permissions are set, right? You need to always minus with the with the file with 66 with the U mask value. Whatever the permission you get, though, this will be the default permission for the file. Default permissions for the file. And this is the default permission for directory given. And chmod is a command to change the permissions later. Later, whenever a user wants to change the permission, right, you have to use the chmod command to change the permission. Correct? To change the permission. Now, Okay, so we saw mkdir is a command to create a directory. Suppose there's a requirement comes where you want to create a directory, something like ABC directory. Inside ABC directory, I want to create a B directory. Inside a B directory, I want to create a C directory. Like parent within a parent, you have to create. Like then you have to use mkdir hyphen P ABC slash B slash C like this. So you are creating a parent within a directory. So how to display it? You can use LS hyphen capital R, specify ABC. See, it will show you what are the internet contents. So ABC contain a B directory, the B contain a C directory, C doesn't have anything like that. 
So this is not but hyphen capital R is not but recursive. Recursively, you are displaying the contents. Like for example, if I do an LSF on capital R, and if I do a ET slash, it is that recursively, see, it will be keep displaying, see. Okay, that's all. So it will show you what are the directories you have. Within inside directory, what are the other subdirectories you have. Within that subdirectory, is there any other thing? So everything will be shown here. Clear? So hyphen capital R means recursively displayed. Okay. Clear, guys? Now, whenever you are creating any directory, like here in this case, I created a directory by name Amar. So if I go inside the Amar directory, it doesn't have anything. Now, whenever you are creating a directory, whenever the directory is empty, you can remove a directory by using rmdr command. rmdr command and then Amar, you will remove a directory. But sometime what happened that the directory might contain some other directories also. Like for example, here, in case of Pratap, it has some file, like there's a Pravin file is there. So suppose if I want to use a rmdr command on Pratap, right? You cannot remove a directory because uh, a Pratap is not an empty directory. So always whenever you are removing any directory, and you want to completely remove it, actually you have to use a RM with a hyphen R recursively and forcefully remove that Pratap directory. Like this we will do. So it doesn't have permission because I've seen the permission, right? CHMOD 775, provide the Pratap and then do a RM hyphen RF and specify the Pratap. Now it will remove it actually. So hyphen R means recursively, S means forcibly. So whenever you want to remove the directory completely, everything, then you have to use a hyphen with a hyphen R with the RM. You have to use a hyphen R and F option. You have to use. Right. Whenever you want to remove a directory, like sorry, whenever you want to remove a file, Alice is a file. There's a file by name Alice or there's a file by name Chandra. I want to remove it. I have to just use RM and then say Chandra. It will remove a file. But what happened, guys? Here, what is very important, what you're seeing here is that actually. No, file within a file, you cannot create like that, madam. File within a file, how you can create a file within a file? You can only create a directory within a directory, right? File within a file, you can't do it, right? Because you have a file, it's a plain ASCII text file. Inside the file, how you can create a file? You can have a directory. The directory can hold multiple files, actually. Not like file within a file. <clears throat> Okay, so you are removing a Chandra directory, Chandra file, sorry, uh, with the help of RM command. Sometime, what happened, guys, uh, in some machines where it will take you to the interactive mode, where it will ask you whether you want to literally remove or not, right? But here in this case, because CentOS is user, okay, it is not asking any interactive mode at all. Suppose, for example, I want to remove the file Girish, actually. Just see, I'm using RM with Girish. It is removing, no problem. It is removing it, it, but it is not taking to some kind of interactive mode. How it will take me in some missions, it will be like that when I'm using RM command, it internally applies a hyphen I option also, and then it will say, like for example, I'm removing Kaushal, see? It take you to the interactive mode where it is saying, oh, whether you want to literally remove the <coughs> Kaushal file. It is asking me, if I say yes, why it will remove? If I say no, it will not remove it. It is taking you all, uh, so it is taking you, so in many missions, many operating system, what will happen that it will take you to the interactive mode. So that's the reason what happened that you, uh, because sometimes what happened accidentally will remove a file without knowing. We'll be speaking with someone and we'll be using RM command on that file and removing it. So later you'll realize that, oh, you're not supposed to remove that file or else you have, uh, you have missed uh, that important file. So always better what happened, right? Whenever you're removing any file, it should go into the interactive mode. So that's the reason, guys, what the people will do, no? Uh, sometime what happened, no? They'll always set an alias. Alias RM is equal to RM hyphen I, like this they will do. Already they will do a setting of this alias like this, actually. So now what happened that now you have a Kishore file. Now I'll just say RM Kishore. See, it will not remove the file at all. It will take it to the interactive mode. So now you have to decide whether you have to say yes or no. So now you'll understand, okay, uh, any anyway, sure I don't want it, I'll say yes, and it will be removed. So for every file, now, for example, if I do an RM of Ravi, it'll take to the interact mode now. Clear? But sometime what happens, you'll say, no, sir, I know what I'm doing. I know I want to remove the remove file. So I don't want this interactive mode. I'll use forcibly, I'll use a hyphen F option to remove the file. Hey, I don't want to get in interactive mode, man. I want to remove that file forcibly. So I have to use a hyphen F option. You might have even seen that hyphen F option I'm also using even while deleting a directory, right? 
for example i want to remove directory as i said earlier rm with hyphen r recursively forcibly i am removing a directory rakesh okay so this is also one of very dangerous because once you remove a directory you cannot recover back the directory or you can recover it is very difficult to recover so always make sure that whenever you're deleting any file or directory make sure that you are appropriately deleting it and whenever you're doing it you make sure that yourself that you are confidently deleting that so that once you delete it definitely you will not it will be difficult to recover that file actually so that's what in many times in my workplace also unknowingly i have removed many of the files unknowingly you know i'll be doing multiple tasks suddenly what happened right in one terminal i'll be doing i'm supposed to remove in that file some files in that particular terminal or in that particular server but i'll be logging in some other server so i'll do something i'll remove it actually so we have seen and later what happened that we have connected to the backup recovery team and they said please restore that files we need those files i have did many times like that so it happens uh, the human that uh, you know we will tend to remove some file unknowingly so please make sure that whenever doing that actually please open your eyes properly see what you are doing and then do it don't do like that uh, you no know, don't do in a you know sleepy mind actually clear okay guys any questions so far anything is going on in your mind anything any questions no sir. we just started guys we just started with a very simple commands actually okay now okay i have removed many files and directory let us we will recreate later after some point of time okay now okay so many other important things are there like we have a rm command we have sorry rm we have already seen we have a cp command we have a move command uh, we have a rename command run command or rename command uh, like in many times yeah definitely we use this commands actually cp command and all right so cp command is something like a, you are copying a file actually it's same thing what you use in uh, your windows or in your dos right cp command right for example i have a uh, alice file i want to create a file as a john file i use a cp command like this cp alice to the john file so whatever you have alice file content you are copying as a john actually right now whenever you are copying a directory actually you have to always use a hyphen r option so why bow directory you want to copy as a, a, a ramesh directory something see you are copying entire content of the why bow and you are giving a name as a ramesh it means that you are creating a new directory by name ramesh whatever the why bow has a content and same thing would be copied into the ramesh so here when you are copying the whole directory content guys you have to always use a hyphen r option very much important so whenever you want to rename a file or whenever you want to uh, like uh, change the uh, file actually we always use a move command actually so here in this case i'll use a move mv no i'm not really going into more options guys because when i if i want to move john into something like hari so i can rename this john file with the mv command see i've renamed the john to hari actually so it does both the jobs actually here what happened that you are actually renaming your file also plus you can even move the file from one directory to another directory so here what happened that i have renamed the file harry from john to harry plus i can even move this file harry under the ramesh directory okay so here harry is not there now if you go to the ramesh directory we could see that now the harry has been moved into this particular inside this rm directory you can do both the jobs you can rename a file as well as you can move that file from one location to other location very important we'll be using so sometime we'll be using a mv hyphen r option if mv hyphen i option also like that options we'll be using so go with the manual page man of move mv command you will get the hyphen r option hyphen i option so so many options are available you can go through it and you understand it but the most used option is mv hyphen r and hyphen i option okay so i'm not really digging more into it because this will take too much time for us to understand. just uh, try to do explain with the cp command you you learn yourself many things okay clear now apart from this guys very important uh, some of the commands like for example in many interviews they might ask you that okay uh, take uh, all these files like here what happened that you have some files like you have an alice file you have a kaushal file you have a ramesh directory web directory my fifo there is and also there is a script actually so you have been told that a hey, please create a tarball for this 
please create a tarball file. It means the tarball is not, but it's a collection or it's an archive of all the files and directories. It is something like in Windows, what you call zip, right? You need to zip a file or data. Right? Similarly, in Linux, uh, you have to create first a tarball and then zip it actually. So how to create a tarball? So you have to use a tar command hyphen CVF, create a verbose and file. We say CVF, that's option. So let me create a tarball with what name I want to create a tarball. With some name, I will create tarball some with the name, my name itself, raj.tar. This is the tar file I'm creating, raj.tar. What are all the files you want to, or directors you want to make part of the tarball? Oh, I want to make the Alice. Okay, I want to make the first script.sh. I want to even keep a Kaushal, a Ramesh directory, a Vaibhav directory. Okay, even my FIFA also I want to do. Even like a ABC directory or Bob directory, Bob file. So all these files are directory, I want to make a part of the tarball. So I have to run a command tar hyphen CVF, specify the destination tarball name. And after that, specify all the files and data's name which you want to make it under the tarball. When you enter it, you could see that <coughs> you have made all this file and directory under this tarball ranch. Now, let me remove all these files. A, B, C. Okay, I can even uh, remove the Alice file, Bob file, first script .sh, Kaushal, my FIFO. Ramesh, Vaibhav. I'm removing everything. Now you could see that I'm only having this one tarball. So just now I create this tarball, tar hyphen CVF, specify the destination tarball name and specify all the files or directories name. You have created a tarball. So if you run the file, file command onto the tar, raj.tar, it will show you that it is a POSIX tar archive. It's an archive or it's a collection of all the files and directories. If you want to check what exactly tarball contain, you can use a tar with the hyphen tvf option and specify the tarball. You could see that it will show that the star file contain all these files and data. Whenever you want to extract the files, the tarball actually, always you have to use tar hyphen xvf and specify the tar file and then enter. And you see that all the files and data have been extracted now. Correct. So I have purposely removed all the files and It was not there. Now when I extracted all, it is appearing now because I just extracted the star ball. How to extract it? Tar hyphen XVF and special tar ball name will get extracted here. But sometime you might be told, you might be asked that, sir, you don't extract here only, sir. Because when you extract the tar ball by using tar and XVF, it will extract in the present directory only. But you will say that, no, sir, it shouldn't get extracted here, sir. It should get extracted into the temp directory. So I have to say that same thing, tar hyphen XVF hyphen capital C and specify the temp directory. See, it will get, it'll get extracted to the destination uh, path, which is the temp directory. Go to the temp directory, insert temp directory. You see all the files and data which have been here. See, you could see that all been extracted here actually. Correct. So this is also a very useful option. You will be using it. But now the question comes, sir, whether this tarball is actually a zip file. This Raj Doctor, is it a zip file? Can I check the file size? Sir, you have to use a do command with hyphen S option, HS option. Do command means disk usage. So whenever you want to check any file or a directory size, you have to use a do command. So when I do a do command with a hyphen H S, H means Human readability, S means summary, we say. Summary, we say. And specify the file raj.tar. You could see that it is showing you as a 12 kilobyte. Okay. Or oh, just a 12 kilobyte, sir. Okay. It is having a, it's an archive, it's a collection. But here what happened, this raj.tar is not a compressed file. It is not a compressed file. So to make it compressed, to make it zip actually, you have to use a dzip too. So dzip and specify the raj dot tar and enter you see now now it has been zipped actually now if you try to check the size of this large dot tar dot user now it will see that it will come to the four kilobytes earlier it was 12 kilobytes now it has come to the four kilobytes so this is the actual zip format so whenever you are applying a gzip onto a tar ball then only that zip will happen it means that then only the compression algorithm will work so there are two uh, types of zippings are there there are two zips are there. There are two types of zips. Of course, there are many are there, but broadly, zip is there, 
and be zip to his directory. These are the two algorithms or the options which or the commands which we use for zipping the tar file actually. So bzip2 has more compression ratio than the bzip actually. So that's the reason guys, whenever you try to download any ta any kind of a zip file or something, you might see it will be having a dot gzip as an extension, gz as an extension. Or else you might have a bzip2 as an extension. Here you are saying that you're having a dot gz as an extension. So now whenever you want to zip a file, uh, whenever you want to create a tab of zip file, now you will try to give this zip file to a friend. So he will take that zip file, he will try to copy the zip file and he will paste it or he will save that in his hard drive. Now what happened, you want to extract it. Now there are, I mean, you can even directly do a tar as an XBF actually. Extract that dot tar dot z. You can extract directly like this also, right? But sometimes what happened, right? You will try to do a first G unzip you will do and then specify the raj dot tar dot z so that the dot z extension will go. Now you got the tar ball. Now you know how to extract tar ball by using tar of an XBF. Raj dot tar. Like this way also you will extract it. But some people what they know, uh, they know that okay, zip is there or G zip is there. Or I can even do a directly tar of an XBF. It'll zip, it'll extract it, no doubt. Earlier in some versions, Linux version, it was not supporting. First, you need to do a G unzip. You have to do that. Then you need to do a tar. But nowadays we can directly extract the tar ball. Dot gzip directly can extract it. Clear? So now you have a raj dot tar. I can even use a bzip2. This is a second method. Bzip2. And specify raj dot tar. Bzip. So I think I have to install that package actually. So how to install the package? Yum install. Sudo yum install. Uh, not sure whether it will be there in the same name, bzip2. Yeah, bzip2, it's a, it's, there's a name with the name bzip2. So, so bzip2 is there already, the package is there. Now I run the bzip2 command, bzip2 raj dot tar. See, it has now compressed. See, you will see the extension as bzip2. If it size, I think it will not make difference because it will be same 4 kilobyte only, but it will do more compression ratio than the gzip actually. So how to extract it? You can run directly like this also. Tar FNXVF, raj dot tar dot bzip. You can extract like directly like this. Always some people what they will say, do b unzip to and then specify raj dot tar dot bzip to. Now you have removed the dot bzip to extension. Now we can extract this like this. Also you can do it. Is it clear guys still here? Guys, is it clear? Till here. So we yes, learned the tarball, we learned the bzip, and we learned the gzip actually. So these are two. Some people might say, sir, there are many other are there. Seven is there. There are many other uh, algorithms are there. Many other companies. Yes, recently a lot of other uh, different algorithm compression has come. But still today also, you would see that most of the people who give a tarball, right, they will either zip it as a gzip or they'll uh, zip it as a bzip too. Whenever you're going, Whenever you're going to the uh, download the kernel.org under the, whenever you're trying to download any kind of a kernel from kernel.org, they will give in both this format, dzip, bzip format, bzip2 format, and gzip format. So what the, usually people will do, they will try to download this bzip2 format of the kernel version and then extract it like that. Is it clear? Okay, fine. Now, apart from that, there are many other commands are there, very nicey, good commands are there. Like, for example, I, whenever I want to check the uh, disk free, because in your Linux system, you are having a lot of partitions. How to check it? You have to run a command D, this, F disk hyphen L option. If you run a F disk hyphen L option, okay, you don't have it. Actually, I will use a cent, uh, you, sudo command. See, can you see that? It will show you what are all the disks are there which are there in your system. So here right now I'm having only one disk, slash dev xvda1. This is the only one uh, partition I have. This is nothing but the bootable partition, okay? And uh, it will give you all the other information about the disk, what is the sectors, okay? What is uh, like how much is the size of your uh, disk, slash it is a 10 GB and all. So you will get some inform extra information. And what is a disk label type? It has a DOS actually. What is a disk identifier? You'll get multiple uh, information from the help of a FTS command. 
Now, if you want to see what are all the different file system which is mounted or which other disk which has been mounted, you have to run a command df-8. What is the command, guys? df-8, come on, and say enter. So here what happened, it will show, you You can see here, this slash dev xcvda, actually, it is a slash partition. It's a slash partition. And you could see the size is 10 GB. And the partition name file system is slash dev xvda1. See, can you make out here, slash dev xvda1? This partition is mounted as a slash partition. Now, if you run a df-h, you could see various columns, like first column, second column, third column, fourth column, fifth column, and sixth column. First column will uh, give you the file system or the disk names. And the last column will give you the mount point. And before that, there's a use percentage there. So this will tell you like how much is the disk used actually. So this command is very helpful. Why? Because that many times you will be monitoring the disks actually. So what you will do, you will be showing more interest in the use percentage. Suppose your slash partition, if it is going above 70 percentage or 75 percent or 80 percentage, shoot out an email saying that, okay, your disk is going more. The disk usage is going above 80 percent. So that the people will get alert actually. So this is one of the automation tasks where usually in industry they do it. So they will always monitor the output of the DFI finish with this. They'll always check that whether which is the partition which is going above 80%. Okay, here we are monitoring slash or we tend to monitor the slash. So slash is still below the threshold at 16%. But if it goes above 80%, send down an, out an email notification to my email address saying that, okay, slash partition is going above 80%. So once I get that alert notification, I will take an appropriate action with it. So this is one of the use case where people tend to use it actually. Correct? Very, very important, very common use case where in every organization, they will try to monitor all the file system disk space actually by executing this df-h command. They'll try to use some filters to arrive with that and then use some conditions, conditions if condition or something to just verify what is the now value, where they will compare the value with whatever the value you have now. They will compare with some standard value, like uh, you would have already used a threshold value of something like 80. So if this value, whatever the value is there now, if it is greater than 80, then take some upper actions. If it is not greater than 80, then don't do anything. Like that, you will write an if condition. Is it clear, guys? Apart from that, like you have a free command, you have seen already this command, free command will give you the RAN space and the swap space. This we already saw yesterday also that if you execute the free command, it will give you the RAM space. What is the RAM and what is the swap space? Clear? Okay, guys. Now, very important is that actually what we're going to understand or what we will be learning in the next now. Next is that very important is that actually you need to learn about something on so pipes. Pipes are very important. Or before the pipe, let me understand about some of the commands related to your process management, actually. Process management. Like, for example, whenever you want to check what are the processes which are running in a system, so I'll always run a command ps command. ps with the hyphen ax option. Whenever I run this command, ps hyphen ax option, you could see that it will show me all the processes which is running in your system. All these are user space process space. And you could see that you are having so many columns are there, like first column, second column, third column, fourth column, fifth column, like that actually. Now, each and every column signifies something. Like for example, here, the first column is nothing but the PID of the process. Very important actually. PID of the process. So PID the process means here what happened right? it will display all the process IDs. Every process in Linux or in Unix has a PID. We call it as a process identification number or we call as in short as a PID. Because the operating system has to do an operation onto a process right? or has to communicate to the process. Hence what happened right it has a PID. And always the first process whatever we are creating is nothing but your the first process number, it's a init process, but here you are saying as a switch to de de decentralized, don't worry about this one, what is currently this one. You, have, you can consider this as init process only. So init is the first process which get created. The rest, all of the process, whatever it is getting created later, are most of them are daemon processes. Are daemon processes. Now, if you see here actually that the first, the first column gives you the information about the process ID. And the second column is done but the terminal, under which terminal this process are running. 
Now you could see that actually that you could see that there are so many question marks are there. It means that these processes are not attached to the terminal. They are not attached to a terminal or they're not running uh, with the help of a terminal or they're not running under some terminal. They're not running. So these processes, you can call this as a daemon processes. One of the characteristic of the daemon process is that actually, guys, it never runs along with any terminal. It is free of terminal. It is not attached to the terminal. That's the reason you could see that many of these processes are having the question mark. It means that it is not using any terminal at all. But if you come down, you might see something, okay, min jetty process is using the terminal TTY S0, okay? It's a serial terminal. Has been jetty, uh, jetty process, it is using a TTY1, right? Bash is using a PTS slash zero terminal, yes. So when I run a TTY command, you could see that it is actually slash PTS slash zero. Yes, good. Now, suppose you want, if I want to run some uh, recursive process, it will be continuously running, you can run yes, sir, and then specify some name, yes, hello. See, this hello string will be keep printing. It will be keep printing. Now, now, if I want to open a duplicate, I'll open a duplicate session. Now, if I execute the PSF and AX command, can you see here? S yes, process is running and it is running onto the terminal PTS slash zero. Even though it is showing a sleep actually, yeah, but it, it has to show the running, but sometimes it, it is running so far that so now it is coming to the running state. Now when you execute it, it, it shows you the running state. Yeah, now it is a running state. It's running only. So here what happened at yes, hello, it is recursively running this thing, hello, hello, into the standard output of the screen. It is keep printing actually. And you could see that it is having this PID. The PID is nothing but 8124 is a PID and it is running under, under the terminal beta zero. So this is the running process which is running your system. Always it occupies a terminal. So if it is not a daemon process, then definitely the process has to be attached to some terminal. Only the daemon process is the one, guys, which doesn't attach to any terminal. That's what it will be running in the background. You cannot kill this process also because it is it's a daemon process. So there are many daemon processes are there which are running as a services in your Linux kernel or in your Linux machine. And those processes will always be up and running those processes cannot be killed like that. Okay, you can. it can only be killed by stopping that service, not by killing the process ID. You cannot kill the daemon process with help of a process ID. No, you cannot kill it. And they're not attached to any terminal at all. That is one of the characteristics. There are multiple characteristics are there, but one of the characteristics of the daemon process is that actually it will be not, it will be without a parent. It will not be, there is no parent for the daemon process, no parent process. And the second point important is that they are not attached to any terminal at all. So those are one of the few of the characteristics of the daemon process and those processes will always be up and running in the background for some work requirement, for some forcible feature requirement, they will be always be running. Like for example, if I want to do, for example, in my system, in a Linux system, I want to do a print operation. I want to do a print operation. So for print operation, you need a printer driver or you need a printer service. So there is a service by name CUP service, C-U-P-S, CUP service. That service, what I'll do, I'll install and I'll configure and I'll run it. So that CUP service will be running in my system as a daemon process. Right? It'll be running in the background, always will be running in the background. Now, why we are making it to run a background? Because a printing operation, you can give at any point of time, right? There's no fixed time, right? You can give in the midnight also, anytime. The printer has to print that, right? Whatever you give the print operation, right? So it means that you need some kind of a process which always be running in the background. And you should uh, it should never get killed at all. So how you can make it by making it as a daemon process? So if you go to the Google and then just do a cup service, some of you might know it actually. Do a cup service. So cup service basically it's a common Unix printing service we say. So this is a service which will be using for achieving any printing operation, right? Clear, guys for achieving some printing operation. So this will always be up and running. So how you'll do it? By a daemon pass. Clear. Now, when I'm running this command, you could see that this S hello is running process and it is, and you could see that, you could see that the second column is that, but the terminal under which running, the third column is that, but the state of the process, arm is running, plus means foreground. 
and what are the time slice has been given for that and the last column is that but the process name so the, all these are nothing but the name of the process as you have to understand it is name of the process you can kill this process either with the name of the process by taking this complete name of the process or else you can kill the process with the help of a pid any one you can use to kill the process actually so here in this case guys what happened right this process continuously running i can kill this process by doing a control c so you have to be in the terminal and you have to just use a control c see you can kill kill the process so whenever i'm doing a control c okay i'm generating a signal actually i'm generating a signal and that signal is nothing but the sig int signal you're generating okay either you can kill this process like this or else you can run the process again the s hello go back here to the other instance of your centos again run a psi phoenix command you will get the process id yes hello the process id 8384 you can possibly kill by using kill minus 9 8384 kill this process process forcibly i brutally kill the process now you come back to the terminal you could see that the process has been killed forcibly and at brutally you have killed the process actually it means that you don't you don't want to even wait for the status of something it is doing don't want to wait it just kill that as it is so hyphen 9 option will forcibly kill that process that will forcibly kill that process is it clear guys now when you execute the ps command so ps command will always show you all the process which are running in a system right you want some elaborate information apart from the pid and apart with you apart from your process name or something like this is command is a top command top command will show the latest information about each and every process see apart from the pid apart from the pid in the process id right you will get some more information like what is the priority of the process okay what is the percent cpu is given given for the process what is the memory has been given what is the time slice which is given for the process and here the finally the process name or the command name so you will get so this is the real time monitoring system through which monitoring command through which actually you can monitor like what exactly uh, currently the the state of the particular process how much memory uh, it is utilizing how much cpu uh, you know cycles it is utilizing okay that every information you will get through this top command very important actually because we'll be using our real time to monitor your system even with the help of this top command also okay now guys in the linux actually what happened right you have a lot of processes are running actually you might come across with a lot of different states of the process also like for example you might there are something like a states states of the processes process are there you will come across the states of the processes so you will see that there are some process which are running always the process which are sleeping sleeping process or we call it as a uh, in interruptible sleeps interruptible sleep process you will see some process which are nothing but the demon process daemo and demon processes you will find some process are in the uh orphan process you have process which are in a mm, zombie state actually zombie process zombie state process apart from the running sleeping you can even have a process with the it's in a stop state actually the process is in a stop state it's in the the process has been stopped actually it is no longer running it is no longer these are some of the different states of the process as we said and even you can categorize this process into these different categories so definitely what happened guys at some point of time whenever a process is running a system it might undergo all these different states sometime the process will be running some of the process will go to sleep state some of the process will go to stop state sometime the process might even enter into zombie state sometime the process might enter into the orphan state so these are the <coughs> states of the process actually okay so you could whenever you see the psx command right the output psx command you could see there some like a s s small s capital s right what is this these are the states of the process actually 
small s means its own session id small s means session id it maintains its own session id lesser means low priority low priority plus means it is running a foreground greater means high priority like that you can understand with the symbol also so whenever the process is running means it will always be in the r like sleeping means capital s like this whatever you are seeing most of the process sleeping only right sleeping right for most of the process sleeping like that stop state means always t t will be the top stop state actually demon process there is nothing like a state orphan process it will be a o zombie process would be in a z actually or sometimes it call it as a defunct actually d u f u n c defunct process or also are called as zombie processes okay so now when you are running this s hello like for example yes hello this process will be continuously running if i do a control z actually could see that the process has been stopped now and the process having some the stop process having some id now so if you go back to this terminal other session if i execute the psx command can you see here this process has been stopped actually 8630 and you could see that the state is t so that's the reason i mentioned here the stop state is always t correct now what happened the process run now what happened right here as soon as it stops right this job will be pushed into some kind of a uh, in the background which pushed into the jobs actually and the job id is one actually if you execute the jobs command you see it is this process has been stopped and the job id is one you can run, rerun the process again by using a command foreground specify the job id one see again it starts running so i do a control z to stop the process it will get stopped i can execute the jobs command to check it like that so most so jobs command will give you all the pending jobs which has yet to run or which are in a stop state right those will be there in this jobs queue actually whenever i execute a jobs queue jobs command it will show you all the pending jobs or the stops jobs which are there actually so and it will always have an id here like this is a job id like this always you can use this job id to rerun that again i can use the fg command to rerun again fg1 and enter see it starts running correct now i don't want it i have to say control c so to kill the process see so when i do a control c it is generating some signal and that signal is a sig int signal sig int signal now in linux or in unix uh, there are 64 signals are there if i execute a command kill minus l can you see there are 64 command uh, 64 signals are there out of which we are using for the signal number 1 to signal number 30 Uh, not 34 yeah 32 or 31 34 up to signal number 34 is used by the normal these are normal signals or we use this signals actually whereas from this here 35 to 64 these are real time signals we don't use it actually so when i am doing a control c actually i am generating a sig int signal so when i am doing yes hello when i'm doing a control c when i'm doing a control it is killing the process but in turn what is the signal it is generated it is generating a sig int signal guys whenever i want to forcibly kill the process which is running i use a kill minus 9 and specify the process id here i'm the 9 means it is a sig kill option sig kill signal sig kill signal will forcibly kill that process actually whenever i'm doing a control t control z i'm stopping the process there it is generating the signal number what is the signal number signal number 19 signal number 19 is running a sig stop signal it is generating a when i do a control z control z means you are actually generating through a shortcut you are generating signal actually the keyboard signals that 19 or nothing but the control z is number is actually generating a sig stop signal so for example if the process is running here slo i have been running slo the process is running fine i'll go back here i'll come back here and i'll execute the psx command now you could see that the slo is running actually the id is 8804 i will do a kill minus 19 19 means what it's six stop signal 8804 see you have stopped the process it doesn't mean that you killed it you come back here see it has been stopped now right it has been stopped now now if you execute psx command see 
Now you could see that the process has been stopped now. So I can either use a kill minus 19 to stop the process because 19 signal is nothing but your stop signal. The single stop signal, 19 signal. Or either you can, in the shortcut, <laughs> you want to achieve this, you can do a control Z. Control Z will internally generate the single stop signal. Is it clear, guys? It will internally generate a six stop signal. So you can play either with a command or either with the shortcuts, actually. Anything. So whenever any pipe is broken, whenever the pipe is not working, you use a SIG, it enters your SIG pipe, SIG, SIG pipe signal to break that process. Sorry, break that pipe, actually. SIG trap, SIG USR, we will discuss after some time when I am explaining about the SIG trap, right? SIG segmentation, violation. These are all some of the very important signals, guys. I mean, we don't use it actually in our shell scripts, but yeah, I mean, if you have a knowledge, it is good only. Okay, most important, which we'll be using in our shell script is nothing but SIG trap signal. This is the fifth signal which we'll be using, at, that's all. This is the only signal which we'll be using. Sometimes we might even use a SIG hub signal also. Okay, these two are some of the important script uh, signals which we'll be using in our script actually. Apart from that, nothing. No, we don't use it anything. So signals are nothing but it is uh, one of the way of communicating and signals will always generate some kind of a routine. So routine means whenever you are doing through a shortcut like control C, control Z, uh, control backspace, anything you are uh, pressing specific keys in a keyboard, right? It generates a signal actually. And that signal will do <coughs> some kind of an operation actually. So a best way to communicate with one process or other process is through signals also. That is also one of the way of communicating. Is it clear, guys? Any doubts you have so far? Yes, I know some of you already knew this or they already know, have a knowledge on this, but just I'm covering up all the basic things. Rajesh, sir. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, sir, uh, when I uh, last month I went through interview process, uh, uh -huh. they went into Linux and they asked me uh, how how you uh, this monitor, how many processes are running on a particular server, and uh, when you have to kill the particular process, uh, how you follow these uh, steps, uh -huh. and uh, explain about zombie process. So, uh -huh. so okay. can we? <laughs> now, see, whenever you. Uh... Whenever you uh, see, that's what. Whenever you are, uh, you are, you are, you want to check a process. Actually, always you have to give the process name. For example, here what happened, right? Here what happened, right? You are okay. Let me run the jobs command and let me run the mc command. Enter. So I'll do a control. Okay. Now uh, I'll coming. I'm coming to that only. I'm, I I will be explaining about this also. What are the stay? What is mean by all these things? I'm just coming to that. Okay. Any anyway, of you ask me now. Now, whenever I'm running a process, I'll use the same thing, yes, hello. This process is running, actually. Yes, this process is running. We can come over here, actually. And what happened, right? You can run a top command here. When you run a top command, you could see that this hello, yes, hello, is actually running. And the process ID is 8988, actually. Right? 8988. So you can just run the top with a hyphen H option or hyphen capital H. Yeah, we can use a top with a hyphen capital H option, pipe it to grep hyphen I of S. There's an option is there. See, it'll be key printing actually. So you know very well that that this will be keep printing. You can even print for two seconds or three seconds. So we can keep print that also. But okay, that's fine. I will I will let you know how to print within two seconds or five seconds. This will be keep printing. Now what you're doing actually that you know that this column, if you if you watch carefully, this column percentage or memory. Okay, this is first column, second column, third column, fourth column, fifth column, sixth column. 7th column, 8th column, 9th column, 10th column. 9th and 10th are not but the CPU utilization as well as the memory. 9th and 10th. So you should always use a, like this. You know that the 9th and 10th column are the CPU. This is the 9th and this is the 10th column, CPU and memory. So you should make sure that you should always arc with the 
print of dollar nine, or you can use the cut command and dollar ten. What happened? Hello? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, yes. I thought I lost the internet. No, so no, sir. Sure. No, sir. <clears throat> no, sir. Okay. Yes, it is coming. So let me check first column, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. So I have to verify. I have to check it out actually. So if uh, if I want to give a uh, let me first check what the value. Because there are two spaces are there here. It might come and consider two space also. Like this, what happened, right? I have to use or I can use a cut command to cut this actually to make sure that only I'm monitoring these two things. And later what happened, right? You can actually redirect that to some file name, something like file one. You can read it to that file. So you will get a file with the name file one. Later you can open that file and do a further processing of whatever you want to do like this. This is how you have to automate it actually. This is one simple way. So auto means in sense that you need to forward it to some file, the output, and then do a final further processing of that file, take that value, compare it to some value, and just say that okay, CPU has gone above 80%, or CPU memory has gone above 90% uh, of utilization. Like that, you can monitor and you can actually send an email notification. This is the only one way, actually. Okay, there are many other commands are there, like for example, you have a Vim stat, IO stat command is also there. Using that also can monitor it actually. Now coming back here in your processes actually, right? Usually what happened guys? <clears throat> Whenever you are having a process, for example, this is a parent process. Parent process, we call it the P process. P means, P means parent process. Whenever the parent process want to create any child process, it will create a child process with the help of the fork system call you know this with the help of a fork system call you know that it will create a child process now what happened right okay now the ch child process will get created child will be running the same thing what the parent was doing actually once the child completes his job once the child completes his job so child will be keep running child will also running the same thing what parent was doing but assume that ch child was given an opportunity to run child was running child will complete the task and it sends a signal or the chld signal to the parent process once it completes the job then what happened that the sig chld signal will be sent and what happened, right? Once the six is six chld signal is received by the parent process what the parent will do parent will try to kill this process or automatically this process will get killed. The child process will get killed. This is how it normally it happens actually. It means that the parent will create a child process, child will do some task. Once the child complete task, it sends a signal to the parent process, which is 6CHLD signal. Once the parent receives the signal, now the parent will understand that, okay, whatever the child has did, it has completed task. Okay, then what happened? That operating system or the kernel will kill that child process. This is the normal behavior which happens every time in a system. Right. So this child process might be running. The child process may be in a sleep or this child process might be in a stop state. It could be in any state. But what happened once the child process, parent process is going to create a child process, this child process will undergo various different states. It might be running. It might be sleeping. It might be in a stop state. Again, it start running like that. It will happen. This is a normal cause. Now, for what happened, right? For example, whenever any process is getting created, the process getting created, the parent process, this is a parent process. Parent process. Now, the parent process is creating a child process. C process is not a child process. 
So how it will create with the help of a fork system call, it creates a child process. We know very well that it creates using a fork system call, it creates a child process. Right. Now child will be doing some task. Parent will also be doing some task, its own task. Now what happened, right? Child will complete its task. Now child will send a signal to the parent saying that, hey, I completed my task, man. I'm sending a signal. What is that signal? SIG CHLD signal. It sends a signal to the parent process. But what happened right? parent might ignore that signal. Due to some reason, parent might be busy executing some task or parent might ignore that signal. Now, child has sent a signal to the parent. So parent have to receive it. But parent was busy doing some other activity or parent might have ignored the signal. It has not entertained this signal at all. It has ignored that signal. Then what happened, guys? Then what happened? That this child process, this child process will go to a zombie state. Zombie state. <clears throat> so what, what do my zombie state mean? See, whenever any, what do my zombie state means? See, whenever any process is created, guys, so many resources are given for each and every process by the operating system. One of the feature or one of the resource what is given for the process is not but the PID. PID is also one of the resource, one of one kind of resource it will be given. Memory is also given. CPU uh, cycle is also given. Like that, there are many uh, resources are given for each and every process. Whenever the child completes his task and whenever it sends a signal to the parent process, if the parent process receives this signal, 6 h signal, all these resources, whatever are given for the child process will also get released. PID will be released. Memory, which is given, will be released. If there, if it, there is any pending signals are there, if any pending CPU cycles are there, even that will be released. All the resources should be given back to your operating system pool or to its uh, to the resource pool. It will be given back actually. But whenever the child process, if by any chance, if it gets to the zombie state, this child process will not release these resources. PID will not be released. Memory will not be released. CPU cycles, those things are now will not be released at all. So it will be unnecessarily occupying all the system resources. So you have to say that, sir, whenever any child process, if it sends a signal to the parent, if the parent by chance ignores the child process, or sorry, ignores the signal which is sent by child after complete task, if it ignores, or, or else you know, child process, parent process might be doing its own task. It might not even accept this signal then there is a chance that the child process will get into a zombie state where the system resources like PID, memory or CPU will not be released. This is all you have to tell. That's all. Don't tell anything more than this. So, so what happened at you will see the process this as a Z process, defunct process or Z or defunct you will see like this. The state of the process you will see the Z. So now what happened at okay, this is one story. And the third story is something like, like you have a parent process you have a parent process. This is a parent process. Parent process is going to create a child process. You know very well now the story. So this is a child process. Child process. Child is doing some task. Parent is doing some task. So child was doing some task. Before the child exits or before the child completes, Parent itself has completed task. Parent itself has got killed. Parent itself is not there now. Okay. Child is still running. It doesn't know my parent has killed. Child is still running. Now child has completed task. Now child will send a signal to the parent, a 6 CHLD signal. It sends a signal to the parent. But while sending it, it notifies that there is no child. There is no parent only. I lost my father only. My parent itself is not there. To whom it sends a signal? Now what happened that this child will hold that pending signal. It will hold that signal. Oh, it is trying to send a signal, but nobody is there to receive that signal because parent itself is not there. Now this child process will get into an orphan state. Orphan is parentless process. Means parentless process. Correct, guys? So somebody, they might ask whether the orphan process will also be there in the system. Yes, sir. For some time, the orphan process will also be there because that 
he the child process send a signal 6 chd signal to the parent process but parent itself is not there then the child will go to an orphan state for some time the child process will be in the orphan state but you know that there is there is our godfather there is a main process there who is that main process here uh, init process is there man init is the first process he is a grandfather for everyone right and the pid of the init process is what is a pid it is one oh no problem man now what happened right now it send a signal to the parent parent is not there it will go to the orphan state now after some point of time what happened right again the child process will send a signal to whom it sends a signal it sends a signal to the to the init process now init process will take care of deallocating this process or not one releasing all the resources whatever it is given for the child right that will be taken care by the init process so to say that sir only for some point of time the orphan state process will be there in the memory or it will be there soon after some time right this child process will also be killed because init process will receive the child sick child signal so vaibhav and others any doubts you have sir is it clarified solomon sir sarvanan ram sir yes yes sir it's clear so i have to only say that what is a zombie process is whenever any process will get into a zombie process right then in that case what happened right the system resources will not be released the system resources will be still utilized by the same process or here in this case the child process will be using this pid memory cp many resources are there it will not be freed at all it will be unnecessarily occupying a lot of so in that case uh, why what will happen if there are multiple zombie hundreds of zombie processes created yes sir if hundreds of zombie processes are created sir it will make your system down it will make your servers down because it unnecessarily uses that uh, utilize it uh, it will not be freed at all so what you will do in that case sir uh, we will try to see whether we want to kill the process or zombie process if it is not been killed sir then there is no there is no chance that we need to reboot the system how you can avoid it actually sir there is a way sir like for example there is a way uh, the program has to make sure that the zombie process should not be created sir like that how the program will do sir something like in their applications sir they have to call something like a wait system call or wait pid system call they have to use it sir effectively wait system call or the wait pid system call they have to use it to make sure that actually the child process or any other process shouldn't get into zombie state so they have to do the implementation in their programming or into their application effectively so that no process should get into the zombie state like that you have to tell okay sir thank you sir sir one more question is sir if uh, we uh, this kill the parent any parent process mm -hmm. associated child process will lapse or what happen with the child process now what happened it's a good question guys so now what happened no so whenever the whenever uh, what happened whenever the parent process is creating a child processes all this child process will be running under the parents session only we say we call it as a parent session id like for example if you go here uh, if you see here in your uh, i'll do a control c uh, i think if you go for the man ps you have seen that when i execute the psx command here you could see that there is a small s is there which we call as session id what do you mean by session id means that when you do a man of ps if this is a very big uh, manner page guys you can go through it completely so if you come down scroll down here also it will show the state of the processor See, the man page is so huge, actually. Can you see here? Process state code, actually. See? Yes. D means uninterpretable sleep, usually IO. R means running. S means it is in a sleep state, actually. T means it's a stop state. Can you see here? Small S means it's a session leader. Less means high priority. N means low priority. Plus means the process is running in a foreground. Now, why I'm telling this? Because that, for example, here in the shell, See, you are under CentOS. Here, you might be running. Yes, hello. This process is running. You will come here. This is also, yes, bye. You will be running multiple process in the shell. In the shell. So, you are having a shell here. So, this is the user. And this is a shell. Bash shell. And this is your kernel. You know this. Now, within the, your bash shell, you will be tend to run multiple processors like this, actually. Multiple processors, multiple applications you are running like this. 
all this application guys it will be running under your bash shell session id it will be running all this process will be attached to a bash shell session id now what they said that once the, all the process are running under some specific shell uh, session id session id now what happened that if we try to kill the bash process itself suppose this is a bash process this is a bash shell or bash itself bash process bash process now if you try to kill the bash process itself minus nine and especially the bash process id all this process guys with running as part of it still running all this process will also get killed automatically so it means that if the parent process has created a multiple child processes you know that all this child process will be under some parent id only it'll be running under the parent session id if the parent itself will get killed right even automatically even all this running child process will also get killed But is there any way to avoid it so that the parent will get killed, the child shouldn't get killed? Yes, there is a way to do it, actually. There's a method to do it. Yes command is basically, it's a command to recursively print the uh, some string in your standard output. So this is a standard output, right? It will be recursively keep printing, right? So if I do a yes, hello, Ram. Then we keep printing hello Ram, hello Ram, hello recursively. Indefinitely we keep printing. Correct. Okay, wipe out any other question? You did you understood whatever? Yeah, yeah, sir. All clear. Actually, uh, the whatever you told uh, this uh, multiple uh, commands uh, intro were asking. That is correct. They are asking, they are expecting many more ways to for doing one work for. Right. These commands and uh, all those uh, who, who, who uh, whatever explained till time, that everything they have asked in 15 to 20 minutes something. <laughs> They'll ask sir, everything uh, because uh, you see what happened now, guys. I will tell you one thing uh, before we stop the session. See, now what happened, right? Yeah, you might have come across with such interviews, guys. But what happened now when you are having, when you are going with applying a job for DevOps and cloud, I think I have already told earlier, there are so many things to be asked nowadays in DevOps and cloud only. They don't have a time to ask any question in Linux. But some crazy people in interview panels they'll be sitting, they're very expertise in Linux. Now they will ask you, okay, let me ask you some question in Linux because they want to judge your knowledge. Actually, I uh, meet uh, this uh, such a guy who have 15 year of experience in this Linux administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are such people and all, they will ask you many things actually. Means even though it will be a DevOps profile or the cloud profile, if you're going for uh, the company where they're pure DevOps work and pure, uh, I mean, cloud, you know, they don't get time, man. Ask you. Suppose you're going for the platform engineering work, you're going for the middleware engineering where you will be working on some servers right from uh, some apache server web servers uh, web spears or else oracle web servers like that or jboss servers right you are purely working on the middle layer, middle layer or you are purely going for an application support engineer right uh, or the production support engineer there they might ask you a lot of questions on linux actually. but nowadays what happened now all this uh, every work no production support engineer devops uh, sorry production support engineer or else it be middleware engineer platform engineer all they are somehow they called as a devops only now because even DevOps engineer will do all the jobs. So in that case, what happened? Right? People are more interested to know, or they are more interested to know about you that how much you know about the DevOps tools. So nowadays, what happened? No, that uh, that hard knowledge on Linux, you no, know, it's almost gone. Nobody's asking really. They expect that you should know. But just for namesake, they if they try to conduct an interview, so just for namesake, if they ask you some few questions, if you are not able to answer the Linux question in a very good way, right? Then they might feel like okay, you are not that much good actually it has happened many times many times it has happened like that some basic questions were not answered by some people they got rejected it has happened like that that is also possible but you can consider that 80 percent or 75 percent at least uh, if you go for interview they will not really ask a linear question if you're purely applying for a devops and cloud job but it doesn't may it doesn't mean that you need not to do but yeah definitely definitely what happened right definitely if you are attending a DevOps and cloud interview, definitely they'll ask you about the automation work. Definitely they'll ask you about the automation work. Yes, man, I will discuss about the difference. H-top and uh, top I will discuss after some time.
Now, what I'm trying to say that I could definitely they'll ask automation, definitely they'll say that have you involved in writing any script? This for sure they will ask me. And you cannot say that no, I have never involved in automation at all. No. You have to say that yes, sir. For many of the manual tasks or many of the requirements, no, I have written a script actually. Like that, you have to tell. Correct. But minute questions like this and all, maybe they might ask, may not, may, might not ask, but according to my experience, uh, the, nowadays they're not, they've stopped asking all Linux questions actually. So, so because, because, uh, why, you are in Pune or you are in Mumbai, no, I know that uh, in many organizations, many companies in Pune or even in uh, uh, Noida company, Noida or else uh, some companies in uh, uh, even Ahmedabad and all, right, they will ask Linux questions also because they are more interested to know how much you know Linux. If you try to apply for a job in Hyderabad or Bangalore, no, or else even in Chennai, uh -huh, they will not ask that much of Linux question. It is by default, you should know it actually. In tradition, I will come back there. <laughs> uh -huh. I will try to come regular. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bank. Yeah, you can come. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. So that's the reason. You know, like a lot of people started pinging. You know, yeah, I'm from Pune. Yeah, <laughs> they ask me. Yeah, definitely they ask me. I know that because uh, they expect uh, uh, you know the person candidate to have all the knowledge. Yes, correct. Even like uh, you'll be surprised. Actually, like uh, I had a. Uh, in my uh, career, actually, I worked even in uh, Ahmedabad also. I worked actually for a period of four months. So uh, after I moved out from HP, it's not like that I directly moved into Central Inc. Actually, I left HP and uh, uh, I got a job in a Ahmedabad company actually. So I went there actually, but uh, uh, I couldn't be there for a longer time because uh, because the place was good, the people were good, everything was good, but you no, know, like uh, I want to come back to the Bangalore actually. So I left uh, the job there for four months, and I came back and I got a job in uh, Central Link. That it, that's how it happened. Like that. So I got a good opportunity to you know see it there. What happened? They are more focused on Linux actually. So they need a lot of things on Linux, a lot of things on automation. Okay, guys, so I will stop this session. I mean, recording, I'll stop it.